Here's the title of my talk. Hopefully it will become obvious uh, what we're going to do today as we go. But just to say that this is a kind of, I think, a really nice project. It's one of those rare opportunities where you get to kind of get some biological insight as a result of some modelling that you've done, but at the same time develop some new theory along the way. Um, I'm going to gloss over and talk about it at quite a high level, but I'm happy to chat about any bits of it later. And just to say thanks to the organisers for the invitation. Thank you to you in advance for listening. I'm going to press the wrong thing to change slides. And oh, there we go. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge up front uh, the people that did this work. So Simon's just on his way in through the door, a uh, PhD student in my group. He, so basically, he did this project, and I'm about to talk about it, which makes me feel a little bit cheeky. And it was in collaboration with Heber Salem, who's a research fellow in the Department of Engineering. So to kick off, um, for those of you that don't know what we do in the group, we're really interested in understanding the mechanisms that drive collective cell ma motility and then how they combine with uh, processes like proliferation and death, cell cell adhesion to give rise to very complicated biological processes. And mostly we focus uh, on aspects of embryo development, but also uh, work in the context of wound healing and regenerative medicine and in pathologies like tissue, uh, sorry, tumour growth. And the idea for me really is that if we can understand how a tissue or an organ develops in the first place, then that provides a great platform for understanding uh, what happens when it's damaged or when something goes wrong. So when I first started my PhD and began to work in developmental biology, which is some years ago, I'd say that developmental biology was completely essentially a qualitative discipline. So when we did experiments or when people did experiments, they were typically with low numbers of replicates. Um, and the data or the observations that came out of that was very much qualitative descriptions of whatever was, was sort of seen in the images that were captured, for example. And if you fast forward then uh, to sort of the last five years, I think developmental biology has really undergone a massive revolution. And I would say that we could now more or less begin to call it a quantitative discipline. So we can, you know, seeing ever increasing kind of development of new methods, which is giving rise to quantitative data um, on ever increasing levels of detail. And I think the real challenge for us as mathematicians, um, theoreticians working in this area, is trying to kind of develop new methodologies to make sure that we really harness that data and get the most insights that we can out of it. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong thing to change slides now. <laughs> there we go. All right. And so what we've really sort of done in the group is uh, sort of transition from being uh, a group that really sort of applies traditional mathematical modeling tools um, to one that combines those tools with statistical and machine learning approaches to provide new insights. And I'm going to show you a bit about that today. So we want to be able to do this in the context of the embryo in in vivo, but a nice place to start much of the time is in vitro in cell biology assays, which are essentially just much simpler. So to give you a few examples, we've looked at growth to confluence assays, where essentially you try to seed cells uniformly at random in a dish and you watch as the population essentially proliferates, it moves around and it grows to confluence. So you might learn something about the proliferation rates there, as you said. And in fact, what we've shown is that if you could take some very, very simple models of those assays, just essentially uh, incorporating migration and proliferation, that you can parameterize those models. But what you do need in order to be able to get a handle on both those parameters is not only to know where cells are, but you need to be able to track them over time. And for me, that's a bit of a disadvantage because that's a, a sort of a quite a painful thing to do often if you look at something like here where you've got a fibroblast population that's quite strange shapes. Uh, so you might want to then move to thinking about an assay with some spatial structure. So we thought a lot about barrier assays where you essentially initialize your cell population, grow them to confluence inside a barrier, looks like a cookie cutter. At time zero, you remove that barrier and you watch as the population proliferates and invades the uh, surrounding space. And we developed a number of models of this, but if you want uh, to hear more about our work in this, uh, in this area, see Yuri's poster, uh, which is just outside across there, where we've thought quite a lot about sort of level of model complexity that's appropriate for these kinds of assays uh, in terms of how well you can parameterize them. The last assay that we thought about is what I would describe as a scratch or a wound healing assay, where you grow a population of cells to confluence in a dish, and then at time T0, you take a pipette or some instrument and you mechanically scrape away a proportion of that cell population. So here, this is the gap. And then you essentially watch as the population proliferates and it migrates to fill the available space, effectively healing that wound. And uh, I guess what I was going to say here was that we've had much more success here, right, in, in parameterizing our models. So they're very simple models of migration and proliferation. 
because I think what's going on in here is that the initial spatial structure in the assay provides much more information in order to be able to back out those two model parameters. So there's certainly differences between these in terms of the available information that they, they give you and therefore how well you can parameterize a model. So fast forward a little bit, these are very, very simple assays. And you kind of might ask, they're so simple, do they really have any place in kind of like modern biology? And the answer is very much yes. So typically these assays are now done in using essentially machines like this thinking site Zoom, where essentially you can handle huge numbers of uh, plates at one time, you know, 100, 300, 400. Um, and not only can you do that, therefore, under very controlled co uh, conditions, you can also essentially analyze that data almost in real time. So instead of taping snapshots every six or every 12 hours, you've almost got real time information from these assays. And they're incredibly widely used to, um, to, 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 for example, in the context of drug discovery for initial drug screening. OK, so this is kind of where we came in our most recent study to thinking about scratch assays. Um, and large-scale in vitro assays. So there's a study by Williams et al. that's published uh, in 2017, where effectively what they did was a huge uh, genome-wide RNAi screen in an endothelial cell uh, a context or population. And um, it was in a scratch assay format. So what they did was they initialized their cells at confluence time zero. They uh, essentially made a scratch to affect the screens. And then they took another uh, image 24 hours later and they analyzed the extent of wound closure after 24 hours. So their kind of high level aim was to be able to, well, first identify some known sort of uh, components of, of signaling pathways that are known to regulate migration, but order to see whether they, and also to see whether they could find some, some new things, or some new genes. So, what they did basically in these assays was looked at time to zero, time 24 hours, and they analyzed the extent of wound closure. And so whilst I think that's informative of the very large scale sort of features of wound healing and, and collective migration, what I don't think that kind of analysis does is really reflect the mechanisms that lead to those changes. So it doesn't for me answer the question of what aspect of cell behavior is being uh, affected by a given genetic perturbation or knockdown. So what we set out to do is to try and ask the question as to whether we could use uh, a, a mechanistic mathematical computational model and combine it with these data to just sort of decode, if you like, the functional impact of knocking down each of these genes. And then we sort of thought, well, maybe we can go a step further and ask whether we can group these genes according to the functional impact that they have so that you might begin to learn whether genes are acting together in similar signaling pathways. So what does the model look like? Try and keep going, so I'm using up time really rapidly. So it is an individual-based uh, stochastic model uh, of cell motility that includes density-dependent effects. And the way in which it does that is it defines a crowding surface. So here, sigma is a measure of the size of the cell, and gamma b, uh, the sort of extent to which crowding matters to a cell. What happens, or how do we use this crowding surface? Well, we use it to define a bias vector for the nth cell. There we go, I can't reach up there. We use it to define a bias vector by just looking at the gradient of the surface at the location of that cell. And then we sample the direction in which the cell is going to move, or it's going to place its daughter cell according to a von Mises distribution. And here, all that really tells you is that the average direction in which the cell moves is in this direction of this bias vector. And as the magnitude of this bias vector goes to zero, so there's um, sort of zero cells surrounding a given cell, then this thing just uh, relaxes to the uniform distribution, so it's moving randomly. OK. And then movement and proliferation are essentially governed by pro Poisson processes. And what happens is that movement uh, essentially will take place at some basal level M. And then you've got a parameter in here, gamma M, which essentially tells you how that movement rate is modulated by the local cell density. And so if gamma M is positive, then cells move less in regions of high density. And if it's negative, then they try and move more in regions of high cell density. And the same thing goes for the proliferation rate. So, this model was first developed or used, I think, in a paper by Alex Browning in Interface. Um, so if you want to know more about it, Alex will be arriving here as a Hook Fellow in uh, the start of October. But in the original paper by Alex, which was applied to scratch assays, he didn't include cell death. Whereas we noticed in some of our assays that essentially 
uh, the cell numbers are going to decrease over the course of the experiment, so we needed to include cell death, and we did that at constant rate D. Okay, so we've now kind of going to apply this model in the context of that huge uh, RNAi screen that I showed you, where they knock down thousands and thousands of genes. So the first thing that we needed was a method to automatically extract information from the data. You can't do this by hand in any sense. So we used Heber's deep scratch analysis pipeline to do that. So effectively, it'll detect cell centers using a nuclear, given the nuclear stain. It do, uses those cell center locations to define the wound perimeter. And then it uses a Voronoi tessellation to establish a measure of the size of the cell. So we can, in an automated sense, put all these images through the deep scratch pipeline and get hold of a huge amount of quantitative information. Um, so, and then what does the model look like and how do we connect the model with the data? So we're going to analyze our images at time t equals zero hours and we're going to use those to initialize the model at time t equals zero hours. And then we're going to simulate uh, or advance the model through to time 24 hours and then we want to make some comparison with the data at time 24 hours to try and learn something about essentially the parameters of this model. So we've got six parameters, um, basal movements, proliferation and death rates, a bias parameter, um, and these two terms which basically encode the extent to which motility and proliferation are impacted by local cell density. We want to work in a Bayesian framework. I'm sure we're going to hear lots more about this uh, over the course of the next couple of days, but in essence what we want to estimate is the uh, posterior distribution of model parameters theta given data d, and we uh, access that through the product of the likelihood of the data d given parameters theta and the prior distribution. So for our model, uh, the likelihood is essentially intractable. So we're going to use approximate Bayesian computation to try and estimate model parameters. So I really like ABC because essentially what that amounts to is doing huge amounts of forward simulation of your model, and it's not really more complicated than that. So for those of you unfamiliar with it, in essence what we're going to do is repeatedly sample some parameter sets from the prior distribution, simulate the model, um, using that parameter set and then essentially compare how close the model output is to the data and then we assign a weight to that parameter essentially accepting so giving it weight one or rejecting it giving it weight zero depending on the distance between the model output and the data so our data is incredibly high dimensional so that kind of refers things back to saying well I'm going to make that comparison in terms of summary statistics for example cell number in the experiment and you have to then think, well, what statistics are sensible? So luckily, because we'd worked on this for quite a long time, and because Alex had already worked on it too, we had a fairly good idea of that. So we were sort of probably quite sorted there. So essentially, we're going to compare model output to data using three statistics, the cell number, the density profile. And again, it's nice in a scratch assay context, because you can average that to get a 1D density profile, which is a bit less noisy. Um, and the pair correlation function, which looks at the number of pairs separated by a given distance, so pairs of cells separated by a given distance. Okay, so what's the, what's the kind of tricky bit here, apart from the fact that it is quite hard to simulate this model uh, lots of times? We've got incredibly uh, large amounts of data is the challenge, right? So for some of these replicates, for some of these gene knockdowns, we've got more than 100 um, replicates, right? So 100 experiments that were conducted. And not only that, there's like huge variability in the initial wound size and shape, right? So this is just two examples, I think, from the mock data set of different wounds, and they're just clearly not the same, which means that you really can't get away with initializing your model with one initial condition and simulating and comparing. For each one of your uh, replicates for a given condition, you basically need to initialize the model given the data at time zero and simulate it forwards in time. So that means that every time you kind of do a round of ABC and you select a parameter from, set from your prior distribution, you need to simulate your model more than 100 times to be able to make those comparisons between model and data. And the short story is that that's just not possible um, with this model. Okay, so what can you do? So this is where Simon had uh, a, a super idea, and you can't see the titles of the slides, can you? But it's called Mini Batch ABC, and it would be at the top. So this is kind of what the, the, the simple ABC rejection sampler that I showed you before looked like. Though it's kind of quite similar, it's just sort of a bit of a tweak on this. So you're going to, a very large number of times, simulate the parameter or generate a parameter set from the, uh, the prior distribution. 
and then you want to simulate the model using this parameter but before you do that what you're going to do is simulate or sorry select or sample a mini batch of the data so if you've maybe got 100 replicates um, from your experiments you're going to sample maybe just 10 of those uniformly at random and with replacements and so that's a much smaller data set to handle going to simulate the model using this parameter set and importantly you're going to do this for each sample from the mini batch individually and then we want to evaluate how close model output is to data as before and we're going to do this in, on an individual footing for each <laughs> thank you for each of the uh, samples from the mini batch and then use the kind of essentially an average of these distances to assign a weight to the parameter uh, to the parameter and so the key thing here is that if my um, if my data set was of size 100, I might use a mini batch of say 10, right? It means I've saved kind of computational cost by a factor of 10 using this algorithm. But the good thing about it is because I'm sampling this mini batch from the data uniformly at random and with replacement, if I'm sampling a large, if I'm sort of um, repeating this process a large number of times, the algorithm is seeing all the data. And so essentially the ABC posterior you get back in the limit is exactly the same ABC posterior that you'd seen just under standard rejection sampling. So there's no change introduced in that sense. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is convince you that this works. It's a sensible thing to do. Um, we can talk more about that offline as well. And also show what happens when you apply it to this RNA eye screen data set. Okay, so the first thing to check, I guess all the first things to check are that you can identify your model parameters or ask a question about which ones you can identify and then ask the question of whether the batch size matters or how much it matters. Take home message is that for this model, I think you can identify three parameters, or we think you can, given this data. So you can get fairly good estimates of the motility parameter M, so that's the baseline motility rate. Get good estimates of the net proliferation rate, so this is P minus D, proliferation minus death in the model. And you can get fairly good estimates of this parameter relates to contact mediation of cell motility. So whether a cell essentially tries to move more, which is <laughs> negative, um, gamma, or less in areas of cell density, right? So in this context, we're picking up very strong signal that this parameter is negative. So cells are trying to move more in regions of high cell density. Can't get particularly or learn a huge amount about the parameters relating to conduct mediation of proliferation or the motility bias, but nonetheless, I think there's a, a good amount that we can learn based on those other three estimates. That's the first thing. And the second thing to say is that this is, I think, the wild type data set. Uh, the results we get are very similar over different uh, sort of batch sizes. So that gives us um, sort of confidence that we can choose in this context a relatively small batch size and still get access to a relatively good posterior or pretty much the same posterior. Okay. So let's apply this algorithm to some different knockdowns and see what happens. Okay, so this is showing you the marginal posterior distributions from three different data sets. So the mock one is just essentially wild type endothelial cells. Then we've got two mutants, one in which CDH5 is knocked down and one in which CDC42 is knocked down. And what can we see? So I think there's quite a lot to talk about in this figure, but because I don't have loads of time, I'm just going to pick up on a few things. The first thing to say probably is that what we see is that, that compared to um, the two mutants in the mock, motility is much more strongly upregulated in regions of high cell density compared to CDC42 and CDH5. So put the other way, CDC42 and CDH5 change their motility much less in regions of high cell density. This is consistent with what we know. Um, so CDC42, um, a sort of loss of it is, is, is sort of known to be correlated with a lack of ability of cells to polarize with defects in cell cell adhesion, which is consistent with this idea of density dependence, kind of things not really playing a role. Um, and CDH5, again, I think in terms of uh, regulation of cell cell junction. So again, all consistent with the fact that it's related to sort of density dependent effects. Okay, so it seems to be working and we can pull out other things as well. So now let's try and apply it. One minute, shoot, I have to speed up. Okay, <laughs> um, let's try and apply it now to the whole data set. And I don't want you to like actually look at this figure. I want, just want to convince you that it's quite difficult to look at all this data. So the way in which we summarized it, so we applied this method to each one of our genes or a good number of them in this RNA eye screen. 
we plotted the posterior mean for each of the knockdown. Sorry, I have to stand still as well. Posterior mean for each of the knockdowns. And then what we wanted to do is use k-means clustering to try and establish whether there are groups in essentially function space. So don't look at that, look at this. OK, so this is uh, a plot that should show you, the colours look slightly funny, that there are three essentially main clusters in phenotype space, a turquoise, a purple, and a sort of green one, uh, distinguished by essentially their differences in their motility parameter, their net proliferation rate, and contact mediation of cell motility. Why do I think this plot is kind of really important, and can we learn a lot from, from looking at this? So if we look at USP18, which sits right up here, and FA7, these are the gene knockdowns in these, for these dots. And then we go back into the data, what can we see? Well, you can see that in both of these contexts, with both of these knockdowns, their wound healing is significantly delayed compared to wild type. But if I just eyeballed this and looked at the extensive wound closure on its own, I wouldn't be able to make any further kind of inference about what was happening and why this was functionally sort of so. But if I go back into the data, what I can see is that for USP18, the reason that wound healing appears to be delayed is because essentially this contact mediation of um, motility parameter is high, which means that cells are moving much, much less in regions of high density. Consistent maybe with the role for USP18 um, in terms of regulating cell adhesion turnover. On the other hand, for FA7, which is right down here, what we're seeing is uh, a low rate of motility and really kind of very low or negative amounts of net cell proliferation. So although they kind of look the same on the surface, the functional kind of me uh, mechanistic kind of um, uh, reason for them looking the similar is very, very different. Um, and on the other hand, for ITPR1, which uh, really does sort of uh, display quite good wound healing, we can see that it's very much as a result of the fact of the cell population moving and proliferating a lot. Again, consistent with a lot of what we know. I promise I'm nearly done. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that you can <laughs> go far, far uh, further into this data. The details are all in the paper. Um, but what you can see is that cell proliferation is density dependent, right? So if we just look at the net proliferation rate and then generate a curve that would naively look at the, self, the fold change in the number of cells over 24 hours, if you just kind of don't take into account, into account density-dependent effects, you get the blue line, uh, which is not very close to the data points, which are the black dots. But if you do, then you can see uh, much better agreement between models and data. So density-dependent effects are important. Um, but proliferation isn't the only driving factor in wound closure. So this is a cell fold change, uh, wound fold change plotted against cell fold change. What we see is that essentially wound fold change depends delicately and non-linear on, on all the model parameters. Um, but actually, and again, the sort of the dependence of wound fold change, so the change in the wound size as a function of the change in the number of cells is not kind of as strong as you'd think it would be if proliferation was the only driving factor. So I'm going to stop there, summarise. Um, I showed you a new approach to ABC, which is called Mini-Batch ABC. It uh, allows you to calibrate models to large data sets. You can combine it with the existing approaches. So I didn't say this, but this was actually all done within an ABC SMC framework without any real change. Um, and that allowed us to calibrate this quite complicated model to data and to infer detail on the mechanisms driving wound closure across knockdowns. Um, I'll leave the last bit because I can always talk about it in questions and just to go oh, wrong one again uh, go back and thank Simon again uh, for doing all of this work and Hebert as a collaborator thanks for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that's great thanks very much Ruth um, do we have any questions from the room Hi, Ruth. Thanks very much for that really interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, on the ABC algorithm and how you go about choosing the uh, threshold statistics for the discrepancy and what the sensitivity, uh, if there is any, to, to those choices. Um, and secondly, about the identifiability issue. I wondered if you'd looked at any sort of bivariate um, plots for those and whether the, you could maybe identify one but not the other if you fix one of those, those parameters. Uh, yeah, all really good questions. Maybe ask the second one first. Um, We've definitely looked at the bivariate plots. It's difficult. There is some, I think, correlation between parameter values, and so we do need to maybe go into that a bit more. I think some of the identifiability issues arise, for example, 
So we can find gamma m, but not gamma p. And I think that might be to do with the fact that there's loads and loads of instances of well cells are kind of interacting with one another, and there's far less proliferative events relative to, to those movement events. So we just kind of not got as much data there. I think also, um, whilst I said we had a good idea of the summary statistics, maybe we haven't, there are, maybe there are summary statistics that are more informative and, and we could go down that line. Um, and also the fact that actually only having data at zero in 24 hours, like just, I was pretty surprised that we could get anything like we could. And it was a very nice surprise, I think, right, Simon, to, to be able to do this well. So I think maybe with more data, we could do better. And I guess we've got another data set at the moment, which is more or less real time. So we'll see. Previous question, um, I guess with mini batch, ABC, um, there's all the same questions about how you change your epsilon tolerance thresholds as there is in any kind of ABC algorithm, right? So that, I don't think that's changed. The only thing you have to watch with mini batch ABC is that it's the var variance in the posterior that's going to be slightly affected. And so I, I don't have access to my slides, but I can show you, I can show in the paper that you, you, you probably don't want to look so just at what the mean of that posterior is doing, but also what the variance of the posterior is doing as you vary the mini batch size. Would you add anything? So I'm all good. Go. Yep, got another question from David. So it's very possible that I didn't fully understand <laughs> how the inference works, but I'm just wondering, so you have this stochastic growth and then you, uh, in the inference, you compare how the surface fronts essentially look or compare to the data. Is it at all possible that you lose a lot of efficiency in your inference simply due to the stochasticity when you have the uniform boundary? that you end up developing, say, blobs some elsewhere in comparison to the data. So if you somehow biased your inference to grow, as you know already in advance, just from the random seeding of the initial growth phase. Does my question make sense? I'm not really sure whether this is actually what you're comparing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I'll try it not. Um, so, so I guess we initialize the simulations based on the data at time t equals zero hours. Yeah. Um, because there is a lot of variability in wound size and also in the sort of shape sometimes at the edge of the okay. wounds. Um, but so if you imagine you have, uh, I just, at least from the images, I couldn't, couldn't really tell, but if you have like a, um, a linear surface, then when you grow, I, I would imagine that nevertheless, just by the stochastic growth, you will develop sort sure. of these bulbs. Yeah, yeah. And if you just randomly happen to grow elsewhere, even though the parameters are correct, you will probably reject. Yes, yeah, so you're going to have some, you know, with any, yeah, with any stochastic model, I think yeah. you're going to run into those. So kind of issues. What I'm wondering is whether you could just bias, I mean, since you know, this is just, you, this is just an artif artifact in the inference mm -hmm. when, when from the stochasticity of the process, maybe you would get high efficiency in the acceptance rate it's simply by just removing this, by biasing the seeding of your growth. Does that make sense? So I think you can't kind of control the growth once you've kind of got the initial conditions. Um, I think it, it's some, it, maybe it's an area in which it's, it's careful choice of summary statistics there that's important, right? So if you're just looking at cell number, then that doesn't necessarily care about like yeah. these kind of random artifacts. So I think probably there that's, that that's where to focus it. The, sorry, I think it's always um, yeah. I think it's always a problem with these models. I don't know if you would say anything, Sam. Um, yeah, I suppose it's important to keep in mind yeah. that what we're explicitly not comparing. Sorry, can I just give you this? So you. Online people can hear. Uh, what we're explicitly not comparing is the precise density at every spatial yeah. location. So I think, as Ruth said, we kind of average so that we get a one-dimensional density profile. So I suppose, in a sense, that sort of artifact doesn't matter. A great deal, but also one of the other summary statistics is the pair correlation function. Yeah. That's really sort of a spatial summary of what the distribution of distances looks like. And I think, yes, it is true that if you were to compare sort of an individual simulation with the individual data, those things wouldn't necessarily align one on one. But these summary statistics do give some sort of measure of how similar the process has evolved over time, if that makes sense. Thank you for your talk, Ruth. Um, so still on the summary statistics, I'm thinking about how do you go about identifying that these ones will be more informative? Yeah, so I didn't put the reference in, but a while ago I had a PhD student who looked at both the growth to confluence assay and the wound healing assay with a very, very simple model and literally kind of screens over um, a huge range of summary statistics and used um, that screen to try and pull out and identify 
what the informative summary statistics were. So we had a pretty good idea that these were useful summary statistics. And there are other slightly different summary statistics that more or less I think you tell you the same things but are, you know, <laughs> defined slightly differently. But I think these are sensible. And actually then Alex Browning used those in his study as well and, and showed that that they were providing at least relevant information for some parameters. But, you know, I, I do think that um, there's two, I think what is very difficult maybe to distinguish here is whether the signature is just not there in the data to allow us to identify the parameter values or whether we haven't quite got the right summary statistics to properly nail them down or the right weighting. So I think that is an open question and, and choice of summary statistics is like lots of people in the room know is like a really, really challenging um, problem. Just a follow up. Um, so that initial set of summary statistics that they screened over, mm. like, do you know how they came about? Like, that's it. Um, we just kind of went through trawl through the literature, and <laughs> so whatever we. I mean, this is not a very scientific thing to say, but took as many as we could find and really just evaluated the quality um, of the posterior. But again, you know, as you'll hear from Aidan tomorrow, that how you evaluate that quality is also um, important as well. So. Time for maybe two more questions. <laughs> it's great there's so many questions. Hi. So for your mini batch, uh, when you fix the batch size, uh, do you also how does that compare to the number of iterations? So I'm kind of surprised that they work really well regardless of the batch size. And uh, so I think uh, so you can do kind of back of the envelope calculation that if you are going to randomly sample a mini batch right so you're gonna so, so you might so we've got a six dimensional parameter space so we're even if it was abc rejection which isn't quite a bit you might need to be sampling from your prior distribution like a million times or something and so if you're randomly sampling with replacement even if you're only taking 10 but you're doing it that a very large number of times the data all of the data is going to be seen by the algorithm at some point and i can't remember the numbers but it's in the SI, I think, or even in the main text of the paper. But you, you can do essentially just a simple calculation to sort of double check how sure you are all the data is going to be used, if that makes sense. But time consuming, like computationally talking, mm -hmm. is it better to have one size batch and many iterations, or like 10 size batch and less many iterations? Or it's not, it's kind of the same? So at the end of the day, I think the algorithm will converge don't quote me on this, but I, I sort of feel like it's going to converge quicker um, if you take a smaller batch size but more samples from the prior than it is going to do the other way around. I think that should be right. My feeling much quicker. But I guess you could think about that, formalising that. I think we haven't. Good question. Great. Hi. Um, a slightly trivial question, but can you go back to the or univariate parameter distributions? I think it was maybe the next slide. Or a couple more. Where are we going? Yes, yeah, so I just wondered. Um, I assume that the x the x axis here is bounded. Yeah. I wondered how you come across these bounds. Are these like known bounds that you that on you the fix? prior? So on the yeah. So I guess most of the parameters. Um, so things like maternity and and the proliferation and death parameters are bounded by zero below and then you can probably get sensible upper bounds and we used a fairly wide prior right to not so if you're going to do abc smc you can afford to start with a relatively uninformed prior i think um it's harder with the contact mediated uh terms in some sense right because you have less good knowledge but i think again looking back at the um, the Browning paper gives you some ideas of where to start, but also you can afford, I think, in that context to, to, to be relatively, uh, take relatively broad priors. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I guess I was kind of thinking if you extended, say, the upper bound, uh, maybe the distribution might be bimodal or something, but by limiting the prior. Um, I think yeah, that's I always, a, is always a, a question. Um, I think this isn't the true extent, Simon, remind me of the... Uh, of the prior right for the maternity rate is it, it's further in that direction but we're just sorry zero to 20 there you go he knows all the details um so yeah i mean it's much further than so that you just set your bounds really wide set the bounds really wide and then it, you'll get there uh, over a number of iterations thanks thanks and i think we've got just time for one more question which is online um i think uh is helen gonna unmute her mic i think <laughs> 
Oh, she's typed it. Okay. I can read it. Oh, do you want me to tell you? So Helen says, uh, could Ruth comment on whether similar results would be obtained using a PDA, PDE model rather than APM? Watch this space. Um, so we've got another data set. <laughs> um, so I think um, in the context of this data set, which was only at time t equals zero and time t equals 24 hours, my hunch would be that you would do less well because some of these summary statistics um, I was about to say you need access to where the cells are. I think that is true, and you, right? And, and I'm not sure that I would. In, I'd have to think about whether you could dig out the same summary statistics of a PDE model. I'm thinking about the pair correlations now, as you could for the individual base model. I think that would be hard. So I think I don't know the PDE model would do as well in this context. But we've got another data set which has got uh, about 45 genes knocked down, and it's more or less in real time. And the data is far less noisy because the the experimental approach was slightly different and I think what we're hopeful there is that we could use a PDE approach because it is going to be quicker I think um, we'll come update on that at some point great well could everyone join me in just thanking Ruth again for excellent talk